all right so <coughs> welcome to lecture number 10 which is the second lecture of capsule number 5 today we are going to look at drag and what efforts are made to reduce drag in the last class we did look at methods to handle wave drag so today we will keep that towards the end if time permits we will revisit just stop it for a minute so there is a door there also so band kar do otherwise they will distract me let's start again okay <coughs> So our task today is to look at drag and its reduction. When we talk about drag, we first have to pay respect to Sir George Cayley, who is widely considered to be the father of aeronautics. This is a portrait of Sir George Cayley and this is the only available photograph, real photograph of Sir George Cayley uh, taken when he was approximately 80 years old. So, drag basically is a force that opposes the motion of the aircraft and it acts only when there is some relative motion between the aircraft and the ambient air. For delta V, the relative velocity between the object and the fluid that is needed to create drag and if there is no relative velocity or if there is no relative motion between the solid and the fluid then there will be no drag. <coughs> we are all familiar that when you have air flow or relative velocity, you get a force and the force is basically the reaction acting on the body. A component of that which is parallel to the free stream direction is called as the drag and that is overcome in flight by providing the thrust force. So, let us wait. Please do not talk when the recording is going on. You know that we are recording this lecture. Yes. No, it is okay now. We'll, we, have, we have interrupted. We are waiting for them to come and sit down. So, come and sit down. Go that side now. You can proceed that side. We have stopped the recording. Okay, now this side is full, so you close this door and you can open that door. <coughs> so, those of you who are in this corner, you can come here. There are three, four, five seats, six seats vacant. I do not want to look at that side. So, you can, is that okay? This side is okay. So, fill up those three plus those two plus this seat unless it is reserved for someone, VVIP. Or you want a special person to sit next to you, only when he or she comes, you will lift your bag. I have request kiya hai, do not come on this side, move on that side. So, allow her to go and as it is, I have told you since beginning, do not sit together with your friend every time. But aap log kar rahe ho. There are people who come in couples and pairs. <coughs> so what will happen if you sit somewhere else? Your learning will be affected, yeah. Okay, that is it. So there can be a Vaga border here, no problem. All right, so shall we continue? Okay, so <coughs> essentially we need to have thrust more than drag if you would like to have forward flight and for that we will look at a special uh, presentation on power plant or engines after the mid semester. So the question that many people want to know is who was the first person to actually talk about drag or observe drag 
and no none other than the father of aeronautics sir george kelly in fact not only drag he was the first person to talk about the four forces and the proof of this is in a silver coin that was etched in 1799 on one side of the coin was a sketch of sir george kelly's glider concept on the back side was this nice diagram which shows the action of the forces on a flat plate so this is the first historical recorded sketch of the four forces acting on any flying body okay and <coughs> he was a scientist who also did lot of experiments so many years before right brothers actually sir george kelly designed and fabricated this whirling arm apparatus which was used to calculate or look at the forces acting on the body here is a small video clip of this apparatus then you will understand you do that so he is trying this is a this is a movie which was kelly had discovered that when a sloping surface was struck through the air the pressure of the air would force the plane upward so this is a precursor to the wind tunnels called as the rotary arm or whirling arm apparatus such systems were used also to calculate the forces acting on airships and other bodies okay and many many years before right brothers actually kelly was able to uh, carry out a manned flight but for that he designed a special aircraft called as a boy carrier because the first ever pilot of a manned aircraft was actually a 10 year old boy and this glider was designed to just accommodate a 10 year old person there is a very interesting uh, 50 page document on history of uh, invention of airplane and on sir george kelly i'm going to upload that on the uh, moodle for self learning that gives a detailed information about what all sir george kelly has done this picture has come from that particular document but he knew that if i attain flight using children or small boys people will not take it seriously so then he designed something called as a governable parachute that's the name given by him so on your left you see a photograph of or the design or the drawing of that on your left you see a drawing of that particular uh, aircraft in a uh, mechanics magazine and on the right we see a full scale replica which was built in approximately 1972 74 where the historical flight was in reenacted by a very brave pilot okay so there is a very interesting story about who was the first pilot to fly so sir george kelly was 79 years old when he designed this particular aircraft and he had recently hired a driver so he told his driver why don't you fly my glider so the driver had to obey his uh, master but he was literally scared so there was a successful flight therefore the first person to fly on a manned aircraft unpowered but manned aircraft which is not a balloon or lighter than air was the coachman and just after the flight he resigned so these are very classical words he says sir i was hired to drive not to fly okay so he resigned his name is john appleby he was the coachman he was 21 years old when he did this particular uh, <coughs> experiment so in history if you want to record the first human being other than that 10 year old child who flew on a glider which was heavier than air but unpowered was john appleby the first flight was about 153 meters and this is the location where it took place so this flight was reenacted as i said in 1972 and in 1974 there was a television series which was shot in which this particular this scene is taken from that particular video series and this is the photo of the full scale replica 
of this particular aircraft. Okay, the pilot was Derek Pigo. Derek Pigo was the pilot who flew. Just a minute. This is my mistake. Should we just put it off? Sorry. So we'll we'll record this sentence again. So here is a picture of the full scale replica of this aircraft which was flown by Derek Pigo in 1972. Notice that the rudder is hand operated. Nowadays rudder is foot operated, but in this particular glider and there is a cable you can see which is attached because it is a glider, there is no power plant. So you launch it with the cable. So it was a very successful flight. Of course, they did a slight design changes and what changes they did and why they did it is an interesting observation which you should uh, read that paper which I am going to upload. All right. So this is just a small video clip in jest, okay. do not take it seriously, but I really liked it. So this small video clip sums up the contribution. Head on with the proper business of pioneering fixed wing aircraft. That man was Sir George Cayley. Silly French, I have no time for dirigibles. It's time for the fundamental principles of flight. I say, what, what, where? My butler flew a glider from here to there. The mechanics of flying, they are a must. Weight, lift, drag, thrust. I need a lightweight engine, but they think I'm demented. So, so in the 50s, they haven't been invented. Cayley's work ushered in the age of steam. From the 1870s, lightweight steam engines were being used for short test flights. And in the 1890s, Samuel Langley achieved an unmanned flight of one kilometer. Just for some fun. Okay, let us look at components of Bragg, break it down into small co <coughs> components. So, this is a very interesting slide, and a lot of time was spent in making this slide. You will know why because you will see there are various components. So, let us first look at subsonic flow. <coughs> Basically, drag consists of many components. The first component is profile drag. This is pressure drag, okay. also called as form drag because it depends on or it is driven basically by the shape of the body, mostly the frontal area. And the pressure drag name comes because it is caused due to creation of pressure on the upper and lower surfaces because of the shape of the body. Now, if you, you have to add to that something called as skin friction drag which is because of the flow of air on the body. So one is shape, the other is the surface area. Together they are called as profile drag. So profile is pressure plus skin friction or form plus skin friction and skin friction as you know can be because of laminar, because of turbulent or because of both laminar and turbulent. So this particular part of drag acts even on bodies which are not generating any lift. So you can call it as lift independent profile drag. We also have some lift dependent profile drag which we will see later. Okay. Is it clear? So something that does not depend upon lift, it is a function of shape or form that is why it is form drag or pressure drag and it is also because of the skin friction. So, the profile drag which does not depend upon lift is also called as parasite drag. Then when you generate lift there will be an additional profile drag because of lift okay. and that component should be a small component at cruise. So the induced drag is only lift dependent. If there is no lift there is no induced drag. And it occurs because of the lift that is generated and the lift is generated because of the vorticity which is shed in the wake. This is the story of subsonic drag. In supersonic flow or in transonic flow actually you can also have wave drag because of the shock waves. And here again there are components, there is a wave drag due to lift and there is a wave drag due to volume. So, all these together you call these components as drag due to lift and on the other hand you have 
zero lift drag. Okay. So, this is the story of drag, this is the breakdown of drag. Let us first attack induced drag, which is created because of lift and the reason why we have induced drag is because of the creation of these vortices. Induced drag is caused by wing tip vortices. These are caused by the difference in the air pressure below and above the wing, as you will remember from the creation of lift video. At the tips of the wing, the higher pressured air below the wing can go around the tip to satisfy its insatiable urge to get with the lower pressure air on top of it. This creates a circular motion of air at the tips of the wings, clockwise on the left, anti-clockwise on the right. The vortice is that this action creates affects the air around it. At the root of the wing, where vortex action is not felt too much, airflow is like this. However, at the wing tips, where there is a lot of the whole vortex action thing going on, airflow is altered to become like this. As you can see, the air is forced upwards in front of the wing and then forced downwards behind it. This alteration of the air then means that the lift generated by the wing is slightly deflected backwards. This lift force going backwards now adds to the drag force and is the induced drag of the aircraft. Induced drag is caused by wing tip vortices. Okay, so These are essentially the induced drag, there are many ways of explaining it. One way of explaining it is because of the presence of the tip or away from the root, you are going to get some upwash before the aircraft and downwash behind the aircraft. So, in a way the air has been made to tilt, so there will be a reaction. So, the lift vector will be canted backwards. So, this is another explanation where the same thing is explained. Let us see how they explain it. At high angles of attack, the high pressure air below the wing likes to swirl around the wing tip towards the low pressure air above the wing. A twisting vortex of air forms behind the wing, deflecting the airflow downwards. An inclined local airflow is created, which is the average of relative airflow and the deflected airflow, resulting in the lift vector tilting backwards and contributing to total drag. At high angles of attack, same thing. Just the tilting back. Now, this tilting back is occurring because of the effect of the presence of the body locally. This does not occur at the wing root where there is a junction. This occurs only at the near or at the wing tips where there is no junction. So, you have relative wind on an aircraft, you have thrust, there is a net reaction, but then there is a backward component and that backward component is the induced drag. So, the, the reason why we have induced drag is because of the vortices at the wing tip. Now, in this case the vortices are made visible, but sometimes nature also tells us or shows us the vortices. So, you can also do it in the wind tunnel. That is the side wash. Oh, yeah. You can see the curling up and inward turning of the vortex at the wing tip. So, that is the downwash. That is the side wash. Oh, yeah. Okay. And if you want to have a visual information, this is a very beautiful video which shows what happens. We have already seen one such video. Here is another one. This is natural flow visualization, but my question to you will be why did the aircraft not land? It is coming into land and then it is rejecting the takeoff. So, what happened? Why is the aircraft not landing? Do you think the pilot brought the aircraft down just to show you the vortices? No, I think the pilot wanted to land. That is why the flaps are down. So, this is something I would like you to answer. Notice it is only on one wing. You can visualize the vortex only on one end of the wing, only on the port wing or the left wing as the pilot sees it. So, this is a question which remains unanswered in the class and therefore, I expect the answer on Moodle. 
somehow people have become little bit lazy on moodle now i asked a question in the last class nobody has answered it i hope you will get the answer to this question okay all right so let's derive the expression for induced drag so induced drag is basically a function of the same forces or the same parameters but here i have used v equivalent and rho zero you know you can replace it with rho in rho infinity and v true square also so the induced drag coefficient cdi is basically a function of square of the lift coefficient and the aspect ratio of the wing and for level flight or when you generate lift cl is equal to l upon half rho v square s so therefore induced drag will be obtained as a function of l square and k so what are the parameters that affect induced drag first is the lift so an aircraft like airbus a380 which will have more lift than a cessna 172 will have more induced drag at the same speed simply because lift is far far more an aircraft <coughs> which has got a very high aspect ratio will have a lower induced drag as compared to an aircraft with low aspect ratio in other words for the same aircraft if you change the aspect ratio if you increase the aspect ratio you will reduce the induced drag of the same aircraft so how do you do this how do you change the aspect ratio of the aircraft during flight what can be done for example any suggestions during flight i want to have a higher aspect ratio created what would you do no suggestions we have one suggestion take a mic please do we have a mic here hmm. so mention your name yeah, there is a mic for you mention your name and then give your suggestion sir my name is deepak yes deepak sir can we use uh, this uh, swept back wing to move forward so that b can increase and so that aspect ratio can increase this is one way one way of doing it is to sweep the wing mm -hmm. to lower sweeps from higher sweep yes. so if you are flying at a high sweep back and if you want to reduce induced drag you we you can sweep the wing ahead that's okay that deepak you are right somewhere there there was a hand raised take a mic yes now it's working sir my name is omitesh mm. uh, we can deploy the flaps mm. so that the AD surface area will increase the aspect ratio will increase in that case so if you increase surface area aspect ratio is span square by area area increase will immediately reduce no? aspect ratio will come down so actually induced drag will increase increase it will not decrease anything else take a mic mention your name so i am vinay hmm if you increase the area of the wing by deflecting the flaps i am assuming it is fowler flap so you are bringing it back aspect ratio will not will not increase it will decrease because it is in the denominator yeah, oh that's fine i understand what you are saying usually the definition of s is the wing reference area which may not include that but my question to you is what is your suggestion to increase aspect ratio during flight sir manikandan ha manikandan yes the angle of attack projected area will reduce so once again we come back to his point of view there is something called as wing reference area which will not change too much so just by increasing angle of attack you will not be able to change the aspect ratio so why are you looking only at s 
see how did how did deepak solve the problem by increasing b can you do something else to increase the span So, we are working on a project in which we are talking of span extension. So, you have a wing which has a wing and a small wing inside and when you want high aspect ratio you take out that wing. So, with that you get a larger wing span obviously, it is not very straightforward, but when you take out the wing what are the problems one is you are eating away the volume available for the fuel in the wing. Secondly, you have to put actuators to create so much load. So, there is a plus and a minus. So, we have a PhD student working on the pluses and the minuses and using <coughs> detailed design calculations, we are trying to figure out what is the limit to which increasing in span is beneficial compared to the drawbacks. So, it is possible to do it by using innovative techniques. You can have a folded wing like this in flight and opens up like this. So, you can do things to increase the span, okay, but it is very, um, it is not very easy. There are many pluses and minuses. The other point is wing area and the equivalent air speed and the air density, okay. So, let us look at the factors which affect the induced drag. So, let us see, now this is not aspect ratio, but induced drag induced drag is more than just aspect ratio. So, <coughs> if you change the angle of attack, then the lift is going to increase, correct. So, this is one way, the angle of attack change is actually going to affect the induced drag. The next parameter is air speed. So, if you change the air speed, the C L will change because you need to maintain lift equal to weight still. So, as the air speed increases, the C L will reduce and if C L reduces, C L square by pi A E will come down. So, that is one way of reducing the induced drag fly faster, okay, that is one solution. Let us look at some other effect, aspect ratio itself that already we have seen. So, you can see that as the aspect ratio is increased, the slope of the lift curve, so C L versus the wing induced coefficient is reducing. So, this is another way. So, when you make larger aspect ratio wing, you have a thinner wing or you have a more slender wing, the wing vortices are weaker because you are going further and further away. So, the induced drag comes down. So, these are some of the ways in which you can address the induced drag. So, what do you do for angle of attack? Do you reduce it or increase it to reduce the induced drag? You reduce angle of attack, you will have higher C L for the same lift. So, that will create more or less induced drag. Answer me. If you reduce angle of attack, what happens to C L also reduces, correct. So, if you increase air speed, C L reduces. If you increase aspect ratio, then also there is a reduction. So, these are the ways in which you can do it. So, let us see one example of a high aspect ratio plane, but this is a remotely controlled plane. Normally, you do not see RC plane with such a large aspect ratio. And she is still in the air. Wow, she is going almost vertical. <laughs> wow, she is fast. But remember that if you make a wing very slender and very thin, then structurally you have to put extra efforts to make it stiff and rigid, okay. it is not coming at no cost. The other way of uh, induced drag management would be to proactively work on the strength of the vortex. So, one way is to put tip plates, 
the one on your left, the one with the blue end is called as a Horner wing tip. It was given by Sigmund Horner and the one on the right is just some kind of a device to create me, uh, methods to reduce the wing tip. The other way is winglets which is very common and most of the modern aircraft now you see with winglets. In fact, there are some people who say that winglets can actually be designed in such a way that they can give you negative drag. Now, that is a questionable claim because that goes against the laws of physics. You have air stream coming from front, how can you do something just by putting a tip so that the it gives you forward force. But there are people who say that by very careful design of a wing tip, you can actually reduce induced drag so much that it is almost like giving it some additional thrust. There are some people who have done very interesting things also on wing tip, which I will show you. High pressure air traveling beneath the wing curls around the wing tip and into the low pressure air traveling over the wing, it causes a vortex or mini tornado that creates drag. The fitted winglets form a barrier, breaking up the vortex and the drag. High pressure air traveling beneath the wing curls around the wing tip and into the low pressure air traveling over the wing. It causes a vortex or mini tornado that creates drag. The fitted winglets form a barrier, breaking up the vortex and the drag. As high pressure air traveling beneath the Okay, so this is how winglets work. This is another interesting way. This is an attempt to copy the working of the birds. If you ever look at the tips of a bird, you find they are like the fingers. They are not flat, they always open up slightly and they keep on manipulating them. So, they are proactively, they have used evolution to learn how much to bend in what way, what frequency. So, some people have attempted this by putting these kind of grids and notice that the angle of this is controllable by the pilots. So, there is a claim that you can reduce the induced drag by 60 percent by using such kind of configuration. So, people have mostly attempted either in gliders or in RC planes, but at least I do not know of any actual aircraft powered aircraft which contains tips like this and which is now commercially available. Okay. So, it is, there is a claim, now we have to see and we have to find literature. This is another interesting way, In, instead of having a tip just create some kind of a spheroid. So, you eliminate, now, now there are two wing tips which are joined together. This has been used in many aircraft. As you can see, there are practical aircraft with passengers which have a very unique kind of wing tip called as a spheroid tip. Okay. So, more about this can be uploaded by people uh, on the Moodle page, some innovative ways or uh, other interesting ways to reduce induced drag. For example, there are people who say you can put a small turbine on the back of the wing tips and that turbine can generate power actually using the air which is curling. Okay, let us look at parasite drag. Parasite drag is a direct result of the air resistance as the airplane flies through the air. There are three types of parasite drag, form drag, interference drag and skin friction drag. Form drag results from the turbulence created as the air tries to flow around the aircraft. Aircraft with larger cross sections will have higher drag than thinner, more streamlined designs. Other items like the landing gear and the antennas on the aircraft will also create form drag. Interference drag occurs in locations over the aircraft where different surfaces meet. For example, where the wings attach to the fuselage. Skin friction drag is caused by the rough imperfections of an airplane's surface. A good example of this are the rivets located on the airplane's skin. These bumps disrupt the airflow from otherwise flowing smoothly along the surface. Parasite drag is a direct So, you just saw that any object that disrupts the flow of air by virtue of its presence that creates what is called as a parasite drag. 
it are it has three components the form drag because of the form or the shape or the frontal area of the body which creates a difference in the pressure on the upper and lower surface or behind and forward of the body so that's what is form drag then you have skin friction drag and you also have interference drag so all these three together they are not at all connected with generation of lift even if you have no lift you will still have these three drags so we call them as parasite drag and this drag increases as the air speed increases in general if you fly slow at a high angle of attack or if you will have higher form drag but when you fly fast at low angle of attack at that time the rubbing of the air on the surface could give you more so it depends on which of these terms is more in magnitude okay so generally at high speeds parasite drag is far far more than induced drag because at high speed cl is low when cl is low cl square by pi ae is low so high speed aircraft are more concerned about parasitic drag reduction low speed aircraft are more concerned about the induced drag reduction okay so all aircraft in which you see special type of tip devices now when you say high speed it doesn't mean mark number 0.7 or high speed basically means very high speed actually uh, beyond uh, mark number 0.9 or 1 1.5 those aircraft they don't bother to put any wing tip devices because they say induced drag is not going to be our main problem we are more worried about wave drag skin friction drag and parasite drag so form drag very high form drag because of landing gear when it is extended very high form drag because of antennae beacons or anything projecting out also very high form drag because of objects which are obstructing the flow such as wing struts now tell me why do you think in this aircraft that you see here they have used these wing struts what are the wing struts doing why are they there anybody here so we have one one suggestion from here so take a mic please yes sir my name is vishnu yes uh, i think that these skirts are provided to give support to the wing right because the wing uh, is seems to be very thin so because of the bending moments it cannot sustain the moves okay now let's let's look at this argument further what do, what do you notice about the wing it is mounted below on the bottom we call this as low wing so why do you have low wing in this aircraft what do you think the hint is that black strip that you see on the wing root so why do you think this aircraft has a low wing any guesses hmm? take a mic mention your name yes no i i don't think no no i don't think you can connect propeller power with high wing or low wing there is no connection i can give you many examples of propeller powered aircraft which are high wing okay yeah, dornier 228 is propeller the downstream of the propeller what is it uh, the wing would be exactly uh, no 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 see there are many aircraft which have propeller and which are high wing or mid wing or low wing so propeller location is not i told you the hint is this black strip yes provide some provision for the pilot to step on and get into the exactly so the black strip is an area where you put your step walk over the wing and get inside the cockpit so that you do not depend on any ground based facility to enter the aircraft a trolley or a <coughs> uh, stair okay so therefore the wing is on the bottom now you could mount the strut on the bottom or on the top to support it 
on the bottom it would have been better because that would have given you the strut in compression. Here the strut will be also in compression because the wing is going to bend up. But when the load comes on a wing with strut on the bottom, the strut is in extension. So, this is actually bad because compression is not good because there can be buckling, it is a very slender strut. So, you are actually creating a tendency of buckling, but there is no place on the bottom because the wing is on the bottom. So, therefore, if you have to put strut, you have to do this, you have to put it on the top. You can minimize the tendency of buckling by joining the member sideways. So, it is a compromise solution, not a very good solution because the top surface of the aircraft is where the maximum lift is generated and there you are putting up these messy things. So, it is not a very good solution, not elegant, does not look neat, creates a lot of drag. So, there will be very high form drag, but perhaps the designers have found that this is the best solution given the circumstance. Then form drag can also be because of the disruption. So, by presence of an object, the flow becomes turbulent, it could be a protruding rivet or it could be something else. So, you can also have form drag because of the presence of some uh, surfaces. We have already seen this in the first lecture. Just after you land, you can see these things come up create extremely high parasite drag and that is intentional because at this point we do not want lift, we want to spoil or kill the lift. So, you create high parasite drag by projecting some surfaces almost perpendicular to the air stream. Okay. So, as the cross sectional area of the aircraft increases, the form drag will increase. So, from 747 to F 16 to Cessna 172, there is a reduction in cross sectional area just by virtue of the size and therefore, you have a lower form drag. Okay. Then skin friction drag, skin friction drag as is mentioned there is created by the movement of air flow near the skin of the aircraft. Let us have a very nice uh, look at a look at a nice video on how it is done. An aircraft moving through the air is having to move through trillions of air particles. Here is the skin of the aircraft and here are a load of air particles. These air particles are too far away to be affected by the aircraft, but these three will be. In this very slowed down film, you can see that as the aircraft moves though the air, air particles close to the skin are absorbing some energy from the aircraft and are accelerating to the aircraft speed. Air particles close to the aircraft move closer to the same speed than those that are further away. This absorption of energy by trillions of air particles is what causes skin friction drag. Obviously, the picture would look like this to start with. The aircraft moving through the air is having to move through trillions of air particles. Right. So, as the aircraft moves, the particles which are near its surface are going to be dragged with it. They are going to consume energy and that is the skin friction. So, we define this by a skin friction coefficient which is basically a ratio of shear stress by the dynamic pressure. So, it is a function of Reynolds number because Reynolds number is present in half rho v square, Mach number because v is affected by Mach number and also the nature of the boundary layer, whether it is laminar, turbulent. Okay. Then we have interference drag. It is present in all situations where two bodies are brought together. So, you have drag of a wing, some x units, drag of the fuselage y units. When you bring y and x together, the drag will not be x plus y, but maybe 1.1 times x plus y. So, this 10 percent extra is the interference drag, because generally there is a negative interference between body A and body B and vice versa generally. But here again people say by very careful design you could have positive interference or you may have less negative interference. So, in general interference drag is always going to be present. You can minimize it, but you cannot say that I have completely removed it. So, you can see here because of interference between the fuselage and the wing at the root, you see a lot of turbulence generated, and that turbulence is the one that is creating condensation of the water vapor. 
you do not see that much condensation happening towards the wing tips. It is more at the roots, wing tips are also doing something, but the concentration is more towards the root. It only shows that at the roots there is a larger mixing happening, that means there is larger interference. So, this is a visual indication of the fact that interference drag is more when there are interfering bodies in the presence. Also notice between the flaps and the spoilers in the previous uh, video or just before, you saw that there is a large disturbance created there, that also creates an interference drag. So, if you have a small angle between the fuselage and the wing, the interference drag is going to be lower. Similarly, if you bring the landing gear nearer to the wing, there will be higher interference. So, there are certain uh, suggestions or hints available for how to locate the two bodies relatively. So, whenever you do a course on aircraft design, you will see that there are many, many ways in which you can attempt to reduce the induced drag, sorry, the interference drag. Most common way is by proper contouring of the body, proper shaping of the body, such as streamlined shape. So, notice how they have put a streamlined cover on the landing gear. And even the wing root junction, especially if you focus attention on this particular place, it is beautifully streamlined. And this particular, so this streamlining is normally done only through wind tunnel testing. It is very difficult to do this numerically, although some people do it, but using CFD analysis to do streamlining is not very elegant because how many cases will you run? So, wind tunnel testing is normally used. Notice how we have streamlined the cowling or the covering over the engine and there is a nice beautiful intake for the air to come in. It is not a very sharp or a harsh intake, especially the intake behind the spinner or behind the center of the, so this intake if you see, this one, this one, they are all streamlined so that the induced passage drag is reduced. Okay. Notice here how the aircraft's body is contoured. So, all these things are done, especially I am very interested to show you the covering of the, few of the landing gear. All these are there for making it look beautiful and also to reduce the drag because of <coughs> interference and uh, form drag. Okay. Look at the contouring of the engine or the nacelle, but you see on the back there are some serrations. Okay. So, now why are these serrations provided? Does anybody know? This is a uh, engine of Boeing 777 I think and it is also there in 787. Yes, so take take a mic please. What? Those are chevrons. Okay. Yeah, uh, they are used to reduce the noise. Correct. So, this, this particular uh, configuration or shape of the rear of the nozzle is a chevron nozzle and the aim of this is to reduce the ground level noise. So, this is Boeing 787 nacelle. Right. Okay. You can see wherever there are interference of two particles, we normally provide some kind of a fairing and the additional weight and the cost of fairing is worthwhile because it reduces the interference drag by a very large amount. Similarly, covers and cowlings or fairings. You can see flap truck fairings. So, these members have been given a particular shape essentially to reduce the drag. We need to have a flap track so that the flaps can move, but if you leave them exposed, they will create drag. So, you normally flare them and also the tail cone. So, what is inside this particular area normally? What do we have inside this? APU, auxiliary power unit. Okay. 
So, the tapering of the rear and the shaping is done essentially for reducing of the form drag of the fuselage. And then we have also seen this creation of smart vertices. So, you can generate the vertices and these can help you. There can be many positions, but this is still an area of research. Some aircraft already have them, but large scale vertices, uh, large large scale water generators are not there. Another example of reducing uh, the drag of the aircraft is to join them to the tail. So, structurally also you have a continuous structure, it helps each other plus you have thinner wings, smaller cord and high aspect ratio. So, it acts, acts like some kind of a support. And then in, uh, in one of some of the modern designs where extremely large aspect ratio wings are being presented, strut braced wings have been proposed. So, there is a big study going on in Virginia Tech on strut based wings and a lot of uh, analyses have been carried out to bring out how a strut braced wing can be overall it can lead to a much better aircraft compared to a conventional one, but then there is a problem you have to be careful about the interference drag of the struts. If you do not design them properly like we saw in the previous example, they can really cause massive interference. Another concept that is very common nowadays is blending wing body where, where is the fuselage and where is the wing we do not know, both of them are blended together. So, you, you put all the payload and the passengers in the wide in the central root cord of the wing and you blend the whole thing with the aircraft. So, this particularly uh, this is specifically what is being uh, suggested for the next generation <coughs> commercial aircraft. Okay. So, wave drag now wave drag is something that we have seen in the last lecture. So, I will not spend too much time on wave drag basically it is there because of the shock waves. Okay and we have seen this same picture last time. One way of reducing the wave drag is to sweep the wings backward and forward. This is an example. Okay. So, let us see a swept wing in action. We saw a video last time also. This highly sophisticated experimental plane follows in the footsteps of the wing axis which pushed the lots of speed and the altitude of the wing. Then I mentioned to you about uh, the Kukuman carrots or Kukuman bumps, which are this so called anti shock body. And this particular uh, body is there to reduce the drag at transonic speeds. So, these are intentions, this is not like use a flap drag and do it, this is something completely different. You can also see them in the design of Concorde aircraft. Okay. So, with this I come to the end. Uh, next class is going to be tomorrow, Friday. We are going to look at a tutorial and then we will conduct the quiz so that we wrap up before the now, I want to use the next few minutes to talk about the assignment, which is the so called mid semester assignment or assignment number 2. But before that, I would like to uh, mention there is I think one team, team number 4 I think, right. So, team number 4, you are the last team remaining. So, your topic is today's topic, drag and its reduction. Go beyond the classroom go beyond the material which I am going to upload for self study and give us uh, some <coughs> nice information about uh, drag and its reduction, right. All right. So, now let me flash to you what is going to be your uh, assignment.
Okay. So, I am going to upload this document, I just wanted to go through with it. So, I want to give you a flavor of flight testing. <clears throat> as I mentioned uh, in the introductory lecture, I was working as a flight test engineer in HEL Nasik for one and a half years, during which we did lot of flight testing for MiG-21 and MiG-27M aircraft. So, during my experience as a flight test engineer, I got a lot of chance to work with actual flight test data and reducing that information into useful, it is called as performance reduction. So, based on that experience, I have uh, created an assignment for you. This assignment is an assignment for every individual. Okay? Uh, I mean, you can actually, I would like you to submit it team wise. Okay? No need for you to upload individually. But it will be nice if you do it individually also, because you will learn a lot. So, those of you who are interested to really learn about uh, flight testing, about how to handle flight test data, how to reduce it to a meaningful one, do it yourself. But for the purpose of uploading, I think I have made it as a team wise assignment. It is up to you how you do it. But I would recommend that everyone does it individually. So, I have created a place in the first where you can mention your team members names and roll numbers. Okay. So, your job is I will give you some flight test data. Using that you have to create the drag polar of that aircraft. The data which I give you is actual data from a simulator. It is actual live data from a simulator of that aircraft. Okay. So, your task is to extract useful data from a raw dump of flight test data and to estimate the lift coefficient, drag coefficient, drag polar and some study and level performance estimations. So, this you can read at leisure when I upload it. What I will give you is a dump, a text file or a simple file which will contain a large string of numbers. If I remember rightly, there are 16,000 entries, 16,000 data points in the file which I am going to give you. What will it contain? The first entry in that column will be a frame number, which is just a number against each line. It is like serial number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but it is not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it is some number. The second entry is the mass of the aircraft, the instantaneous mass of the aircraft as measured on the simulator. The third entry is F engine, which is the total instantaneous thrust produced by the engine in Newtons. So, the mass is in kg, but the thrust is in Newtons. The next entry is the true air speed, the next entry is the calibrated air speed and the next entry is the altitude and the last one is the ground speed. So, using this information, you have to now draw the drag polar of the aircraft. So, this data was generated in the following fashion. First of all, let me show you for which aircraft this data is. This data is for this particular aircraft C-130 Hercules. So, <clears throat> the pilot was asked to take the aircraft to an altitude of approximately 3000, 3 kilometers altitude and trim the aircraft to a constant speed. Now, the pilot can trim the aircraft to any speed at which the aircraft can fly, right from little bit higher than V stall to V max. So, we told the pilot please try to fly the aircraft at various speeds in level flight. And when you bring the aircraft to level flight at a particular speed, you press a button and data gets recorded. And if I remember rightly, there are 1600 frames for one velocity. So, 1600 lines approximately will be for one velocity. You will notice that the V will be constant roughly constant, it cannot be constant 
2 to 30, 230.1, 2, like that there will be slight fluctuation. Similarly, the height also will be fluctuating slightly, but the pilot was told trim the aircraft at various speeds in level flight and press the button and the recording gets done. So, using this information, you have to estimate the drag polar of the aircraft. And also in the exercise, there are some questions in the end about some numbers to be calculated. Okay. So, this is something you have to now do. I am going to just upload. Maybe I can just, uh, if I have it with me, I will just also project the text file. I am not sure if I have it. I have to just see if I have the text file with me. No, I do not have it handy with me. I will give it to you. I will upload that file. Okay. Are there any questions about the assignment? Yes, the information given to you is that the pilot has been requested to trim the aircraft at various velocities in level flight. Okay. I think also at the same altitude, but go by the data. What is confirmed is that the data consists of series of level flight segments flown by the pilot from some minimum speed, I think 170 knots to whatever maximum the pilot can go. So, one question that I am going to ask you is what is the maximum speed of the aircraft as recorded by the data. So, purely for the purpose of ease in evaluation, I am saying that you put the information and submit it. If, if you really want to learn and enjoy the exercise, you should do it yourself. It does not take much time. Okay. So, I think with that we can stop for today and we meet tomorrow morning again. Thank you. Now, one more thing, what you can do, you can tell the other friends in the class who could not come. This lecture is being recorded and they have promised to give us the recording. So, again in the evening, I think at 6 p.m., this recording will be replayed in the aerospace seminar hall. Okay. If I get time, if I have the energy, I will also be there. Maybe I will again give a lecture, but most probably it will be a recording which Manideep is going to screen. So, you are welcome to come again if you are interested.